This is the eighth lesson of To Kill a Mockingbird, in which we cover chapters 10 and 11, taking us to the end of part one of the novel. These online lessons have been prepared for the grade 10s of St. Patrick's CBC in Kimberley, South Africa. The English department of CBC has made the decision to share as many of our online resources as possible as our contribution to easing the burden of students and teachers during the coronavirus pandemic. I will be reading to you from the Heinemann edition of the novel, starting on page 95. Chapter 10 is a key chapter, as it explains the title of the novel. While reading, look out for these three elements. Firstly, why are the children sometimes ashamed of Atticus? Secondly, what do we learn about Atticus in this chapter? And thirdly, why is the novel entitled To Kill a Mockingbird? Watch out for this quote in chapter 10. Shoot all the blue jays you want if you can hit them, but remember, it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. Turn to page 95, the beginning of chapter 10. It's the chapter known as the Mad Dog chapter. Atticus was feeble. He was nearly 50. When Jem and I asked him why he was so old, he said he got started late, which we felt reflected upon his abilities and manliness. He was much older than the parents of our school contemporaries, and there was nothing Jem or I could say about him when our classmates said, My father, Jem was football crazy. Atticus was never too tired to play keep away. But when Jem wanted to tackle him, Atticus would say, I'm too old for that, son. Our father didn't do anything. He worked in an office, not in a drugstore. Atticus did not drive a dump truck for the county. He was not the sheriff. He didn't farm, work in a garage, or do anything that could possibly arouse the admiration of anyone. Besides that, he wore glasses. He was nearly blind in his left eye and said left eyes were the tribal curse of the finches. Whenever he wanted to see something well, he turned his head and looked from his right eye. Turn to page 96. Skip eight lines. Go to the second paragraph. When he gave us our air rifles, Atticus wouldn't teach us to shoot. You'll remember the air rifles that Uncle Jack brought for Christmas. Uncle Jack instructed us in the rudiments thereof. He said Atticus wasn't interested in guns. Atticus said to Jem one day, I'd rather you shot at tin cans in the backyard, but I know you'll go after birds. Shoot all the blue jays you want if you can hit them, but remember, it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. That was the only time I ever heard Atticus say it was a sin to do something, and I asked Miss Maudie about it. Your father's right, she said. Mockingbirds don't do one thing but make music for us to enjoy. They don't eat up people's gardens, don't nest in corn cribs. They don't do one thing but sing their hearts out for us, and that's why it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. And as we get to know Boo Radley and Tom Robinson more, we'll understand that they are the metaphorical mockingbirds in the novel. We're going to skip quite a bit now. Skip a whole page, two pages in fact, and go to page 98, 12 lines from the top of the page. One Saturday, Jem and I decided to go exploring with our air rifles to see if we could find a rabbit or a squirrel. 
We'd gone about 500 yards beyond the Radley place when I noticed Jem squinting at something down the street. He had turned his head to one side and was looking out of the corners of his eyes. What you looking at? Oh, that old dog down yonder. Oh, that's old Tim Johnson, ain't it? Yeah. Tim Johnson was the property of Mr. Harry Johnson, who drove the mobile bus and lived on the southern edge of town. Tim was a liver-coloured bird dog, the pet of Maycomb. What's he doing? Oh, I don't know, Scott. We better go home. Oh, Jem, it's February. I, I don't care. I'm going to tell Cull. We raced home and ran to the kitchen. Cull, can you come down the sidewalk a minute? What for, Jem? I can't come down the sidewalk every time you want me. Well, there's something wrong with an old dog down yonder. I can't wrap up any dog's foot now. There's some gauze in the bathroom. Go get it and do it yourself. Oh, he's sick, Cull. Something's wrong with him. Oh, what's he doing? Trying to catch his tail? N no, he's doing like this. And Jem gulped like a goldfish, hunched his shoulders and twitched his torso. He's going like that, only not like he means to. Are you telling me a story, Jem Finch? No, Cull, I swear I'm not. Was he running? No, he's just moseying along, so slow you can hardly tell it. He's coming this way. Calpurnia rinsed her hands and followed Jem into the yard. I don't see any dog. She followed us beyond the Radley place and looked where Jem pointed. Tim Johnson was not much more than a speck in the distance, but he was closer to us. He walked erratically as if his right legs were shorter than his left legs. He reminded me of a car stuck in a sand bed. Oh, he's gone lopsided. Calpurnia stared, then grabbed us by the shoulders and ran us home. She shut the wood door behind us, went to the telephone and shouted, Give me Mr. Finch's office. Mr. Finch, this is Cull. I swear to God, there's a mad dog down the street a piece. He's coming this way. Yes, sir. He's Mr. Finch. I declare he is old Tim Johnson. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. She hung up and shook her head when we tried to ask her what Atticus had said. She rattled the telephone hook and said, Miss Eulamay, now, ma'am, I'm through talking to Mr. Finch. Please don't connect me no more. Listen, Miss Eulamay, can you call Miss Rachel and Miss Stephanie Crawford and whoever's got a phone on this street and tell them a mad dog's coming? Please, ma'am. I know it's February, Miss Eulamay, but I know a mad dog when I see one. Please, ma'am, hurry. Calpurnia asked Jem, Radley's got a phone? Well, they won't come out anyway, Cal. Well, I don't care. I'm going to tell them. She ran to the front porch, Jem and I at her heels. You stay in that house, she yelled. Calpurnia's message had been received by the neighbourhood. Every wood door within our range of vision was closed tight. We saw no trace of Tim Johnson. We watched Calpurnia running towards the Radley place, holding her skirt and apron above her knees. She went up to the front steps and banged on the door. She got no answer, and she shouted, Mr. Nathan, Mr. Arthur, mad dog's coming, mad dog's coming. Was well, she supposed to go round in back, I said. Jem shook his head. Don't make any difference now, he said. Calpurnia pounded on the door in vain. No one acknowledged her warning. No one seemed to have heard it. Scott's innocent comment is breathtaking in its prejudice. She comments to Jem that Cull is supposed to go around in back. Because Cull is a black woman, a maid, she's not supposed to go through the front doors of houses. It's a small sentence, seemingly insignificant, but it shows you very clearly how endemic the racism is. As Calpurnia sprinted to the back porch, a black Ford swung into the driveway. 
Atticus and Mr. Hick Tate got out. Mr. Hick Tate was the sheriff of Maycomb County. He was as tall as Atticus, but thinner. He was long-nosed, wore boots with shiny metal eye holes, boot pants, and a lumber jacket. His belt had a row of bullets sticking in it. He carried a heavy rifle. When he and Atticus reached the porch, Jem opened the door. Stay inside, son. Where is he, Cull? Oh, he ought to be here by now, said Calpurnia, pointing down the street. Not running, is he? No, sir, he's in the twitching stage, Mr. Heck. Should we go after him, Heck? Now we better wait, Mr. Finch. They usually go in a straight line, but you never can tell. He might follow the curve. I hope he does, or he'll go straight in the Radley backyard. Let's wait a minute. I don't think he'll get in the Radley yard. The fence will stop him. He'll probably follow the road. I thought mad dogs foamed at the mouth, galloped, leaped and lunged at throats. And I thought they did it in August. Had Tim Johnson behaved thus, I would have been less frightened. Nothing is more deadly than a deserted waiting street. The trees were still, the mocking birds were silent. The carpenters at Miss Maudie's house had vanished. I heard Mr. Tate sniff, then blow his nose. I saw him shift his gun to the crook of his arm. I saw Miss Stephanie Crawford's face framed in the glass window of her front door. Miss Maudie appeared and stood beside her. Atticus put his foot on the rung of a chair and rubbed his hand slowly down the side of his thigh. There he is. Tim Johnson came into sight, walking dazedly in the inner rim of the curve parallel to the Radley house. Look at him. Mr. Hick said they walked in a straight line. He can't even stay in the road. Well, he looks more sick than anything. Or let anything get in front of him and he'll come straight at it. By now I'm sure you've realised that the dog, Tim Johnson, must have rabies, usually associated with the summer months, August in the Northern Hemisphere. Mr. Tate put his hand to his forehead and leaned forward. He's got it all right, Mr. Finch. Tim Johnson was advancing at a snail's pace, but he was not playing or sniffing at foliage. He seemed dedicated to one course and motivated by an invisible force that was inching him towards us. We could see him shiver like a horse shedding flies. His jaw opened and shut. He was a list, but he was being pulled gradually towards us. He's looking for a place to die, said Jem. He is far from dead, Jem. He hasn't got started yet. Tim Johnson reached the side street that ran in front of the Radley place and what remained of his poor mind made him pause and seem to consider which road he would take. He made a few hesitant steps and stopped in front of the Radley gate and then he tried to turn around but was having difficulty. Atticus said, He's within range, Heck. You better get him now before he goes down the side street. Lord knows who's around the corner. Go inside, Curl. Calpurnia opened the screen door, latched it behind her, then unlatched it and held onto the hook. She tried to block Jem and me with her body, but we looked out from beneath her arms. Take him, Mr. Finch. Mr. Tate handed the rifle to Atticus. Jem and I nearly fainted. Don't waste time, Heck. Go on, Mr. Finch. This is a one-shot job. Don't just stand there, Heck. He won't wait all day for you. For God's sake, Mr. Finch, look where he is. Miss, and you'll go straight into the Radley house. I can't shoot that well, and you know it. Well, I haven't shot a gun in 30 years. Oh, I'd feel mighty comfortable if you did now. In a fog, 
Jem and I watched our father take the gun and walk out into the middle of the street. He walked quickly, but I thought he moved like an underwater swimmer. Time had slowed to a nauseating crawl. When Atticus raised his glasses, Calpurnia murmured, Sweet Jesus, help him. Atticus pushed his glasses to his forehead. They slipped down and he dropped them in the street. In the silence, I heard them crack. Atticus rubbed his eyes and chin. We saw him blink hard. In front of the Radley gate, Tim Johnson had made up what was left of his mind. He had finally turned himself around to pursue his original course up our street. He made two steps forward, then stopped and raised his head. We saw his body go rigid. With movements so swift they seemed simultaneous, Atticus's hand yanked a ball-tipped lever as he brought the gun to his shoulder. The rifle cracked. Tim Johnson leaped, flopped over and crumpled on the sidewalk in a brown and white heap. He didn't know what hit him. Mr. Tate jumped off the porch and ran to the Radley place. He stopped in front of the dog, squatted, turned around and tapped his finger on his forehead above his left eye. You were a little to the right, Mr. Finch. Always was. If I had my druthers, I'd take a shotgun. Doors opened one by one, and the neighbourhood slowly came alive. Jem was paralysed. I pinched him to get him moving, but when Atticus saw us coming, he called, Stay where you are. When Mr Tate and Atticus returned to the yard, Mr Tate was smiling. I'll have Zebo collect him. You haven't forgot much, Mr. Finch. They say it never leaves you. Atticus was silent. Atticus? Yes? Nothing. I saw that. One shot, Finch. Atticus wheeled around and faced Miss Maudie. They looked at one another without saying anything, and Atticus got into the sheriff's car. Come here, he said to Jem. Don't you go near that dog, you understand? Don't go near him. He's just as dangerous dead as alive. Yes, sir. A Atticus? What, son? Nothing. What's the matter with you, boy? Can't you talk? Said Mr. Tate, grinning at Jem. Didn't you know your daddy's hush, heck? Let's go back to town. When they drove away, Jem and I went to Miss Stephanie's front steps. We sat waiting for Zebo to arrive in the garbage truck. Jem sat in numb confusion, and Miss Stephanie said, Ah, 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 who'd have thought of a mad dog in February? Maybe he wasn't mad. Maybe he was just crazy. I'd hate to see Harry Johnson's face when he gets in from the mobile run and finds Atticus Finch has shot his dog. Betty was just full of fleas from somewhere. Miss Maudie said Miss Stephanie would be singing a different tune if Tim Johnson was still coming up the street, that they'd find out soon enough they'd send his head to Montgomery. Jem became vaguely articulate. Did you see him, Scout? Do you see him just standing there? And all of a sudden he just relaxed all over and it looked like that gun was a part of him and he did it so quick like... I have to aim for ten minutes before I can hit something. Miss Maudie grinned wickedly. Well now, Miss Jean Louise, you still think your father can't do anything? Are you still ashamed of him? No. I forgot to tell you the other day that besides playing the Jew's harp, Atticus Finch was the deadest shot in Maycomb County in his time. Dead shot? That's what I said, Jem Finch. Guess you'll change your tune now. The very idea. Didn't you know his nickname was all one shot when he was a boy? Why, down at the landing, when he was coming up, if he shot 15 times and hit 14 doves, he'd complain about wasting ammunition. Well, he never said anything about that. Well, never said anything about it, did he? No, ma'am. I wonder why he never goes hunting now, I said. Or well, maybe I can tell you. 
If your father's anything, he's civilized in his heart. Marksmanship is a gift of God, a talent. Oh, you have to practice to make it perfect. But shooting's different from playing the piano or the like. I think. Maybe he put his gun down when he realized that God had given him an unfair advantage over most living things. I guess he decided he wouldn't shoot till he had to. And he had to today. Well, it looks like he'd be proud of it, I said. People in their right minds never take pride in their talents, said Miss Maudie. Scott's embarrassment about Atticus's old age and his lack of ability at physical things is really just an extension of the theme of prejudice. Jem and Scott have preconceived notions of what their father can and cannot do. When Atticus shoots the dog, the children are forced to re-evaluate their opinions about their father. As readers, our respect for Atticus is developing. He is clearly a man of principle, a just man, a good man. These qualities make him the ideal person to defend Tom Robinson in the court case, which we'll read about in part two of the novel. You have the quotation from which the title of this novel is taken. Start your own notes on the title and think of reasons why Boo Radley and Tom Robinson can be considered mockingbirds. Let's get started with chapter 11, the last chapter of part one of the novel. In this chapter, Look out for the references to bravery and courage. How would you define these terms and how are they defined in the novel? We'll also meet Mrs. Dubose, a thoroughly nasty old lady who has a huge impact on Jem's life in particular. And chapter 11 sets the scene for the court case that will happen in part two, when the themes of racism, prejudice and courage are amplified by the author, Harper Lee. And we begin at the beginning of the chapter on page 105. When we were small, Jem and I confined our activities to the southern neighbourhood. But when I was well into the second grade at school and tormenting Boo Radley became passé, the business section of Maycomb drew us frequently up the street past the real property of Mrs. Henry Lafayette Dubose. It was impossible to go to town without passing her house unless we wished to walk a mile out of the way. Previous minor encounters with her left me with no desire for more. But James said I had to grow up sometime. Skip a paragraph. Jem and I hated her. If she was on the porch when we passed, we would be raked by her wrathful gaze, subjected to ruthless interrogation regarding our behaviour, and given a melancholy prediction on what we would amount to when we grew up, which was always nothing. We had long ago given up the idea of walking past her house on the opposite side of the street. That only made her raise her voice and let the whole neighbourhood in on it. We could do nothing to please her. If I said, as sunnily as I could, Hey, Mrs. Dubose, I would receive for an answer, Don't you say hey to me, you ugly girl. You say good afternoon, Mrs. Dubose. She was vicious. Once she heard Jem refer to our father as Atticus, and her reaction was apoplectic. Besides being the sassiest, most disrespectful mutts who ever passed her way, we were told that it was quite a pity our father had not remarried after our mother's death. A lovelier lady than our mother never lived, she said, and it was heartbreaking the way Atticus Finch let her children run wild. I didn't remember our mother, but Jem did, 
He would tell me about her sometimes, and he went livid when Mrs. Dubose shot us this message. Skip six lines. Easy does it, son, Atticus would say. She's an old lady and she's ill. You just hold your head high and be a gentleman. Whatever she says to you, it's your job not to let her make you mad. Jem would say she mustn't be very sick. She hollered so. When the three of us came to her house, Atticus would sweep off his hat, wave gallantly to her and say, Good evening, Mrs. Dubose. You look like a picture this evening. Well, I never heard Atticus say like a picture of what? He would tell her the courthouse news and would say he hoped with all his heart that she'd have a good day tomorrow. He would return his hat to his head, swing me to his shoulders in her very presence, and we would go home in the twilight. It was times like these when I thought my father, who hated guns and had never been to any wars, was the bravest man who ever lived. The day after Jem's twelfth birthday, his money was burning up his pockets, so we headed for town in the early afternoon. Jem thought he had enough to buy a miniature steam engine for himself and a twirling baton for me. I had long had my eye on that baton. It was at VJ Elmore's, the name of the shop. It was bedecked with sequins and tinsel, and it cost 17 cents. It was then my burning ambition to grow up and twirl with the Macon County High School Band. Having developed my talent to where I could throw up a stick and almost catch it coming down, I had caused Calpurnia to deny me entrance to the house every time she saw me with a stick in my hand. I felt that I could overcome this defect with a real baton, and I thought it generous of Jem to buy one for me. Mrs. Dubose was stationed on her porch when we went by. Where are you two going at this time of day? Playing hooky, I suppose. I'll just call up the principal and tell him. Oh, it's Saturday, Mrs. Dubose. Makes no difference if it's Saturday. I wonder if your father knows where you are. Oh, Mrs. Dubose, we've been going to town by ourselves since we were this high. Don't you lie to me, Jeremy Finch. Maudie Atkinson told me you broke down her scuppernong arbor this morning. She's going to tell your father, and then you'll wish you never saw the light of day. If you aren't sent to the reform school before next week, my name's not Dubose. Jem, who hadn't been near Miss Mordy's Scuppernong Arbor since last summer, and who knew Miss Mordy wouldn't tell Atticus if he had, issued a general denial. Don't you contradict me, and you, she pointed an arthritic finger at me, what are you doing in those overalls? You should be in a dress and camisole, young lady. You'll grow up waiting on tables if somebody doesn't change your ways. A eh, finch waiting on tables at the OK Cafe? Ha! I was terrified. The OK Cafe was a dim organization on the north side of the square. I grabbed James' hand, but he shook me loose. Come on, Scott. Don't pay any attention to her. Just hold your head high and be a gentleman. But Mrs. Dubose held us. Not only a finch waiting on tables, but one in the courthouse lawing for black people. Jem stiffened. Mrs. Dubose's shot had gone home and she knew it. Yes, indeed, what has this world come to when a finch goes against his raising? I'll tell you, she put her hand to her mouth, and when she drew it away, it trailed a long silver thread of saliva. Your father is no better than the black folk and trash he works for. Jem was scarlet. Can you imagine someone saying that to you about your father? Skip four lines. I wasn't sure what Jem resented most, but I took umbrage at Mrs. Dubose's assessment of the family's mental hygiene. I had become almost accustomed to hearing insults aimed at Atticus, but this was the first one coming from an adult. 
Except for her remarks about Atticus, Mrs. Dubose's attack was only routine. There was a hint of summer in the air. In the shadows it was cool, but the sun was warm, which meant good times coming. No school and dill. Jem bought his steam engine, and we went by Elmore's for my baton. Jem took no pleasure in his acquisition. He jammed it in his pocket and walked silently beside me towards home. On the way home, I nearly hit Mr. Link Dears, who said, Look out now, Scout, when I missed a toss. And when we approached Mrs. Dubose's house, my baton was grimy from having picked it up out of the dirt so many times. She was not on the porch. In later years, I sometimes wondered exactly what made Jem do it. What made him break the bonds of you just be a gentleman's son and the phase of self-conscious rectitude he had recently entered? At the time, however, I thought the only explanation for what he did was that for a few minutes he simply went mad. What Jem did was something I'd do as a matter of course had I not been under Atticus's interdict, which I assumed included not fighting horrible old ladies. We had just come to her gate when Jem snatched my baton and ran flailing wildly up the steps into Mrs. Dubose's front yard, forgetting everything Atticus had said, forgetting that she packed a pistol under her shawls, forgetting that if Mrs. Dubose missed, her girl Jessie probably wouldn't. He didn't begin to calm down until he had cut the tops off every camellia bush Mrs. Dubose owned, until the ground was littered with green buds and leaves. He bent my baton against his knee, snapped it in two and threw it down. By that time... I was shrieking. Jem yanked my hair, said he didn't care. He'd do it again if he got a chance, and if I didn't shut up, he'd pull every hair out of my head. I didn't shut up, and he kicked me. I lost my balance and fell on my face. Jem picked me up roughly, but looked like he was sorry. There was nothing to say. We did not choose to meet Atticus coming home that evening. Skip ten lines. Two geological ages later, we heard the soles of Atticus's shoes scrape the front steps. The screen door slammed. There was a pause. Atticus was at the hat rack in the hall, and we heard him call, Jem! His voice was like the winter wind. Atticus switched on the ceiling light in the living room and found us there, frozen still. He carried my baton in one hand, its filthy yellow tassel trailed on the rug. He held out his other hand. It contained fat camellia buds. Jem, are you responsible for this? Yes, sir. Why do you do it? She said, you lord, for black people and trash. You did this because she said that? Yes, sir. Son, I have no doubt that you've been annoyed by your contemporaries about me lawing for black people, as you say. But to do something like this to a sick old lady is inexcusable. I strongly advise you to go down and have a talk with Mrs. Dubose. Come straight home afterwards. Go on, I said. I followed Jem out of the living room. Come back here, Atticus said to me. I came back. Skip 16 lines. It's not time to worry yet, Atticus said to Scott. I never thought Jem would be the one to lose his head over this. I thought I'd have more trouble with you. I said I didn't see why we had to keep our heads anyway, that nobody I knew at school had to keep his head about anything. Scout, when summer comes, you'll have to keep your head about far worse things. It's not fair for you and Jem, I know that. 
But sometimes we have to make the best of things. And the way we conduct ourselves when the chips are down. Well, all I can say is when you and Jem are grown, maybe you'll look back on this with some compassion and some feeling that I didn't let you down. This case, Tom Robinson's case, is something that goes to the essence of a man's conscience. Scout, I couldn't go to church and worship God if I didn't try to help that man. Atticus, you must be wrong. Well, how's that? Well, most folks seem to think they're right and you're wrong. <laughs> they're certainly entitled to think that. And they're entitled to full respect for their opinions. But before I can live with other folks, I've got to live with myself. The one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. That's a very, very important quote. Please highlight it. The one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. When Jem returned, he found me still in Atticus's lap. Well, son, three lines. Well, I cleaned it up for her and said I was sorry, but I ain't, and that I'd work on them every Saturday and try to make them grow back. Well, there was no point in saying you were sorry if you aren't. Jem, she's old and ill. You can't hold her responsible for what she says and does. Of course, I'd rather she'd have said it to me than to either of you. But we can't always have our druthers. Atticus, she wants me to read to her. Read to her? Yes, sir. She wants me to come every afternoon after school and Saturdays and read to her out loud for two hours. Atticus, do I have to? Certainly. But she wants me to do it for a month. Well, then you'll do it for a month. Atticus, it's all right on the sidewalk, but inside it's it's all dark and creepy. There's shadows and things on the ceilings. Well, that should appeal to your imagination. Just pretend you're inside the Radley house. The following Monday afternoon, Jem and I climbed the steep front steps to Mrs. Dubose's house and padded down the open hallway. Jem, armed with Ivanhoe, a well-known novel, and full of superior knowledge, knocked at the second door on the left. Mrs. Dubose? Is that you, Jem Finch? You got your sister with you. I don't let them both in, Jessie. Jessie admitted us and went off to the kitchen. Four lines. In the corner of the room was a brass bed, and in the bed was Mrs. Dubose. I wondered if Jem's activities had put her there, and for a moment I felt sorry for her. She was lying under a pile of quilts and looked almost friendly. So you brought that dirty little sister of yours, did you? My sister ain't dirty and I ain't scared of you. You may commence reading, Jeremy. Come closer, come to the side of the bed. Last line of that page. She was horrible. Her face was the colour of a dirty pillowcase and the corners of her mouth glistened with wet, which inched like a glacier down the deep grooves enclosing her chin. Old age liver spots dotted her cheeks, and her pale eyes had black pinpoint pupils. Her hands were knobbly, and the cuticles were grown up over her fingernails. Her bottom plate of her false teeth was not in, and her upper lip protruded, and from time to time she would draw her nether lip to her upper plate and carry her chin with it. This made the wet move faster. I didn't look any more than I had to. Jem reopened Ivanhoe and began reading. I tried to keep up with him, but he read too fast. When Jem came to a word he didn't know, he skipped it, but Mrs. Dubose would catch him and make him spell it out. Three lines. 
As he read along, I noticed that Mrs. Dubose's corrections grew fewer and farther between, that Jem had even left one sentence dangling in midair. She wasn't listening. I looked towards the bed. Something had happened to her. She lay on her back with the quilts up to her chin. Only her head and shoulders were visible. Her head moved slowly from side to side. From time to time she would open her mouth wide and I could see her tongue undulate faintly. Cords of saliva would collect on her lips. She would draw them in and then open her mouth again. Four lines. I pulled Jem's sleeve. Mrs. Dubose, are you all right? She didn't hear him. The alarm clock went off and scared us stiff. A minute later, nerves still tingling, Jem and I were on the sidewalk headed for home. We didn't run away. Jessie sent us. Before the clock wound down, she was in the room pushing Jem and me out of it. Shoo, you all go home. Jem hesitated at the door. It's time for her medicine. It was only 3.45 when we got home, so Jem and I drop-kicked in the backyard until it was time to meet Atticus. Atticus had two yellow pencils for me and a football magazine for Jem, which I suppose was a silent reward for our first day's session with Mrs. Dubose. Jem told him what happened. Did she frighten you? No, sir, but she's so nasty. She has fits or something. She spits a lot. She can't help that. When people are sick, they don't look nice sometimes. Well, she scared me. Well, you don't have to go with Jem, you know. The next afternoon at Mrs. Dubose's was the same as the first, and so was the next, until gradually a pattern emerged. Everything would begin normally, that is, Mrs. Dubose would hound Jem for a while on her favourite subjects, her camellias and our father's black person loving propensities. She would grow increasingly silent and then go away from us. The alarm clock would ring, Jessie would shoo us out, and the rest of the day was ours. Atticus, what exactly is an N lover? Has somebody been calling you that? No, sir. Mrs. Dubose calls you that. She warms up every afternoon calling you that. Francis called me that last Christmas. Th that's when I first heard it. Why, is that the reason you jumped on him? Yes, sir. Well, then why are you asking me what it means? I tried to explain to Atticus that it wasn't so much what Francis said that had infuriated me the way he had said it. Sorry, it infuriated me as the way he had said it. It was like he'd said snot nose or something. Scout, N lover is just one of those terms that don't mean anything, like snot nose. It's hard to explain. Ignorant, trashy people use it when they think somebody's favouring black people over and above themselves. It has slipped into usage with some people like ourselves when they want a common, ugly term to label somebody. Well, you aren't really an N-lover, are you? I certainly am. I do my best to love everybody. I'm hard put sometimes, baby. It's never an insult to be called what somebody thinks is a bad name. It just shows you how poor that person is. It doesn't hurt you. So don't let Mrs. Dubose get you down. She has enough troubles of her own. One afternoon, a month later, Jem was ploughing his way through Sir Walter Scout, as Jem called him, and Mrs. Dubose was correcting him at every turn, when there was a knock at the door. Come in! Atticus came in. He went to the bed and took Mrs. Dubose's hand. Well, I was coming from the office and I didn't see the children. I thought they might still be here. Mrs. Dubose smiled at him. For the life of me, I could not figure out how she could bring herself to speak to him when she seemed to hate him so. Do you know what time it is, Atticus? Well, exactly 14 minutes past five. 
the alarm clock set for 5.30. I want you to know that. And it suddenly came to me that each day we had been staying a little longer at Mrs. Dubose's, that the alarm clock went off a few minutes later every day, and that she was well into one of her fits by the time it sounded. Today, she had antagonized Jem for nearly two hours with no intention of having a fit, and I felt hopelessly trapped. The alarm clock was the signal for our release. If one day it did not ring, what would we do? I have a feeling that Jem's reading days are numbered, said Atticus. Only a week longer, I think, just to make sure, but... Just one more week, son. No. Yes, said Atticus. The following week found us back at Mrs. Dubose's. The alarm clock had ceased sounding, but Mrs. Dubose would release us with, That'll do. So late in the afternoon, Atticus would be home reading the paper when we returned. Although her fits had passed off, she was in every other way her old self. When Sir Walter Scott became involved in lengthy descriptions of moats and castles, Mrs. Dubose would become bored and pick on us. Jeremy Finch, I told you you'd live to regret tearing up camellias. You regret it now, don't you? Jem would say he certainly did. Thought you would kill my snow on the mountain, did you? Well, Jessie says the top's growing back out. Next time you'll know how to do it right, won't you? You'll pull it up by the roots, won't you? Jem would say he certainly would. Don't you mutter at me, boy. You hold up your head and say, yes, ma'am. Don't guess you feel like holding it up, though, with your father, what he is. Skip four lines. At last the day came. When Mrs. Dubose said, that'll do, one afternoon she added, and that's all. Good day to you. It was over. We bounded down the sidewalk on a spree of sheer relief, leaping and howling. Skip seven lines. Atticus was in the middle of a newspaper column one evening when the telephone rang. He answered it and then went back to the hat rack in the hall. I'm going down to Mrs. Dubose's for a while. I won't be long. But Atticus stayed away until long past my bedtime. When he returned, he was carrying a candy box. Atticus sat down in the living room and put the box on the floor beside his chair. What did she want? We hadn't seen Mrs. Dubose for over a month. She was never on the porch anymore when we passed. She's dead, son. She died a few minutes ago. Oh, well, well is right. She's not suffering any more. She was sick for a long time. Son, didn't you know what her fits were? Mrs. Dubose was a morphine addict. She took it as a painkiller for years. The doctor put her on it. She'd have spent the rest of her life on it and died without so much agony, but she was too contrary. Sir, just before your escapade, she called me to make her will. Dr. Reynolds told her she only had a few months left. Her business affairs were in perfect order, but she said there's still one thing out of order. What was that? She said she was going to leave this world beholden to nothing and nobody. Jim, when you're as sick as she was, it's all right to take anything to make it easier. But it wasn't all right for her. She said she meant to break herself of it before she died. And that's what she did. You mean that's what her fits were? Yes, that's what they were. Most of the time you were reading to her, I doubt if she heard a word you said. Her whole mind and body were concentrated on that alarm clock. If you hadn't fallen into her hands, I'd have made you go read to her anyway. It may have been some distraction. And there was another reason. Did she die free? 
as the mountain air. She was conscious to the last, almost. Conscious and cantankerous. She still disapproved heartily of my doings and said I'd probably spend the rest of my life bailing you out of jail. She had, Jessie, fix you this box. Atticus reached down and picked up the candy box. He handed it to Jem. Jem opened the box. Inside, surrounded by wads of damp cotton, was a white, waxy, perfect camellia. It was a snow on the mountain. Jem's eyes nearly popped out of his head. Old hell devil, old hell devil, why can't she leave me alone? In a flash, Atticus was up and standing over him. Jem buried his face in Atticus's shirt front. Shh. I think that was her way of telling you. Everything is all right now, Jem. Everything's all right. You know, she was a great lady. A lady? After all those things she said about you? A lady? She was. She had her own views about things, a lot different from mine, maybe, son. I told you that if you hadn't lost your head, I'd have made you go read to her. I wanted you to see something about her. I wanted you to see what real courage is, instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand. It's when you know you licked before you begin, but you begin anyway, and you see it through no matter what. You rarely win, but sometimes you do. Mrs. DuBose won all 98 pounds of her. According to her views, she died beholden to nothing and nobody. She was the bravest person I ever knew. Jem picked up the candy box and threw it in the fire. He picked up the camellia and when I went off to bed, I saw him fingering the wide petals. Atticus was reading the paper. And thus ends part one. That quote about courage not being a man with a gun in his hand is significant. It's an example of foreshadowing, especially when Atticus says, it's when you know you licked before you begin, but you begin anyway, and you see it through no matter what. And that, of course, is foreshadowing for the court case that will come in part two. It's obvious that courage and bravery are the most important themes in this chapter. Mrs. DuBose might have been a nasty old lady, but she teaches the children a tremendous life lesson. The addiction to morphine is probably due to the constant pain suffered as a symptom of a serious illness, possibly cancer. I hope that as readers, you did feel some sympathy for Mrs. DuBose in this chapter as you learned more and more about her illness and how much she was suffering. As I said when reading the last pages of chapter 11, Atticus's words about being brave enough to start something which you know you'll lose is an example of foreshadowing. It's already clear that the people of Maycomb do not approve of Atticus, a white lawyer, defending Tom Robinson, a black man. Please answer these questions in your notebooks, giving as much detail and textual evidence as possible. When you have finished, let me know and I'll email the model answers to you. We have completed part one of To Kill a Mockingbird. Spend the rest of your lesson time this week ensuring that you've got good, complete notes on the themes and characters as found in part one. You'll be writing a literary essay in the exams at the end of the term. 
you should already be able to predict some possible essay questions. Please remember to subscribe to the Mrs. M Teaches English YouTube channel so that you don't miss out on any video lessons. And until the next time, stay safe everyone.